Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for the post-mortem of the Bitcoin halving uh, run by ByteTree with a lineup of fantastic industry special guests. I'll be your host today, CEO of ByteTree, James Bennett. I'm joined by Charlie Morris, uh, co-founder and chairman, as well as our CTO, Mark Griffiths, who is in the uh, control room uh, running the show for us today. So we are extremely excited uh, to be running this show with you. Um, and I'll give you a quick overview of the agenda evening, before we dive into the meat of the presentation. So uh, we will start with an introduction on the halving, what has happened um, and, and what do we expect uh, in the next, um, in, in the coming weeks. And then we'll talk to our special guests um, in four different slots of 30 minutes each, interviewing across a range of topics um, and then we'll we'll conclude there. You're welcome to ask questions throughout the event uh, in the box, and we have our wonderful marketing guru Laura uh, will be there to answer those and direct those questions to us. Okay, fantastic. So uh, let's get going. So the halving has officially happened uh, as of yesterday. Uh, we went from twelve and a half to six point two five blocks rewarded uh, per new. Um, per new block. So um, what happened was particularly exciting was that the um, mining company F2 pool actually put a message into the penultimate block stating that the New York Times on the 9th of April reported uh, that there was a $2.3 trillion injection um, into, uh, from the Fed uh, into, the, into the economy that far exceeded the previous uh, 2008 injection. Uh, so that is foreshadowing the inflationary environment that we all expect to come out of the back of this uh, huge monetary sort of easing. Um, and, and amongst others, we had Paul Tudor Jones, legendary hedge fund manager, uh, saying that he has allocated between one and 2% of a huge portfolio to this emerging asset class, specifically to Bitcoin. Very exciting times. So, yes, the halving has arrived and we've dropped from a 4% inflation rate to a 2% inflation rate for the next four years. Um, and we have another halving to look forward to after that. So I'd have, quite like to have a quick look at a few charts in order to frame uh, what the previous halvings have looked like and also uh, this current one. So we can get an idea of where we think price and volatility will sit over the coming months ahead. So control, uh, Mr. Mark Griffiths, can you please bring up price versus volatility in 2012? Okay, so here on the left side of the chart, we can see the volatility over a 30 day rolling window. Um, we peaked at about, oh, and I should say that the dotted line, the vertical line in the middle of the chart marked when the halving happened and the gray line marks the price. So we can see how was price volatility uh, occurring in the run up to the halving and how did price respond. So we can, we can see about two months before the 2012 halving, uh, we got to 150% volatility, very high. Um, price had a, a relatively straight run at the halving and subsequently uh, started to climb uh, in the following months. If we can then pull up 2016, what we can see there, a similar sort of pattern, a few months before the halving, we reached about 80% volatility. The halving event itself was a high volatility event, um, and then price struggled to uh, re retain its level over the months ahead, um, and, and only climbing around six months after that. So finally, the 2020 halving that we had yesterday. Uh, similar sort of story. A month before the halving, we saw a peak in volatility. People get very excited around these events. Um, this time, price crashed. Big liquidation event in the markets on the 12th of March. But that gives us a really strong foundation to build off. You can see that Bitcoin has trended down since July of last year and is now getting ready to break through that trend at about 10,500 uh, is, is breaking the trend. So it's an extremely exciting time. Uh, we've we've been building steadily up to this this point, and uh, and we're very positive for the uh, months ahead. So that's it from me. I'll pass over to our chairman uh, Charlie Morris to say a bit about the past halvings, um, and then we will get stuck into the interviews. Charlie, 
Over to you. Great. So I have no idea how to see the charts. I can't see anything on my screen. So I'm just going to talk. Right. So in 2012, we had a halving and the price um, um, uh, didn't go up. And it didn't go up in 2016 and it hasn't up this time. So that is all I have to say about halvings this time, James. Over to you. Just to wind up, James, just getting you going. Now we've got loads to talk about here. So the, <laughs> the look on his face is, is, is worth it for just, just, uh, just for that. So this is a, this is a post-halving party. The blockchain Olympics come around every four years. It's a very important moment. And, um, and we would like to, um, to talk about through, uh, through past halvings um, in a bit more detail. I think the point is back in 2012, you know, we, we have a sort of valuation framework at, at, at ByteTree. And the um, you know, the price of Bitcoin was trading at its discount to, to what we believe to be its fair value, and you know I wasn't involved in, in Bitcoin in 2012. I, I ridiculously um, dismissed it back in 2011 when someone told me about it. But I came back in 13. But what I do know, one of our guests who's coming later was there into the halving in 2012, Paul Gordon, and he will tell you that there really wasn't much of a fanfare. Not much happened. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a, a, a of a buzz beforehand, but really not much. But the 2016, I was a part of. Now, I do remember that very clearly. Um, and what we, what we saw was the price go from a you know, discount in the run-up because we had a big bear market in 2014, a settling down period in 2015. And the price was your Bitcoin was pretty cheap. And then that happened in July. But in June, um, the price ran up as the hype came in. And so we, you know, the price of Bitcoin went to a premium uh, and actually crashed a month before halving as the speculators got cold feet. It wasn't until the end of the year, till around November, December time, that Bitcoin then carried on to make a new high for the year. And then the recent halving that we've had, we've basically spent um, quite a long time at a premium. So the, so the, um, in, in the run up, so you know, in 2012, we went into it in a discount, cheap Bitcoins went in um, and, and the whole thing was a bit of a non-event. It interrupted an uptrend that was already there. In 2016, it was the early stages of a bull market that was just kind of getting going um, and, and there was a bit of volatility. This time it's been hugely hyped, including what we're doing right now, having a lot of fun around it. Um, but you know, the price of Bitcoin was about 80% above fair value um, earlier this year. Obviously, the COVID crisis corrected that. We don't really know, looking at the price you know, in years to come and looking back, we won't really know how much is the COVID crisis, um, how much is you know, Bitcoin network and how much is halving hype. Trying to separate the three things is really difficult. Um, but you know, right now, the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin premium is about 30% um, above fair value, um, and, and, and that's fine. You know, but we think, you know, looking at our metrics, the whole space is doing well and we think it's onwards and upwards from here. Fabulous. OK, so now it's time for our first uh, panel event of the evening. I can see we have uh, the wonderful Mona Eliza, um, founder and CEO of Avantgarde Finance and um, the, the, one of the brains behind Melon. Um, we have uh, Laurent Cassis the MD at 21 Shares and uh, Amun. And we also have uh, James Bowater, who is the uh, founder of um, the Crypto Insider under the City AM um, and has done a huge amount taking crypto or digital assets mainstream in, in London. So before I hand over to the guests, um, this first section is going to be uh, talking about access to dig digital assets across the whole spectrum from retail to institutional. Um, and I just wanted to drop in a piece of research I read earlier this week from Acuity that said of traditional trading firms that had made a decision not to trade digital assets, 97% will consider the opportunity again in the next two years. And 45% were planning to revisit the idea in six months or less. We've seen Grayscale Investment Trust hit an all-time high in assets under management, 3.3 billion, with half a billion invested in Q1 alone. And on top of that, a report from PwC that just came out um, mentioned that assets under management of crypto funds grew to $2 billion by the end of 2019, which was double the year before. And the average size of those funds um, in terms of the AUM increased from 4.3 to 8.2 million dollars. So while we may not recognize or see uh, the signs, there are certainly undercurrents and tones of, of, of um, this industry transforming uh, in front of our eyes. So with that said, um, we will kick off um, Lohan Cassis, <coughs> the at 21 shares in Amun. Would you like to give a, a short introduction uh, to yourself? 
Sure. Thanks, James. And thanks for the whole team, Charlie, Mark. Uh, it's a delight to be part of this uh, event again uh, that Charlie and I actually witnessed four years ago. So I'm very delighted. Um, I've been with um, 21 shares now for just under a year. I was the CEO of XPT Provider prior to this in Sweden. And I've been fascinated by trying to list um, products, financial products, such as ETFs, ETPs, ETNs, ETCs, whatever you want to call them, uh, with the underlying of crypto assets. And I was uh, fortunate to be able to do this with XBT. I am now fortunate to do it with 21 shares, a Swiss-based issuer of crypto ETPs. And I think the place is pretty much open to any other contenders. We've not had many. And it's a bit of a shame, really, because when you look at the landscape in, in Europe, particularly because I can only talk about the European markets, it's, um, it's very much based on two um, issuers in the conventional markets. You've got structured products, of course, but they're obviously a lot harder to, uh, to access. But the, uh, the real you know, Bitcoin ETP that we've seen so far are the two companies I mentioned, and uh, and there's not been any other competitors since. So from that perspective, you know, I think there's uh, there's definitely place for um, other contenders. I think Twenty One Shares has done a great job by listing eleven products today, including the very recent one, which is a short inverse Bitcoin ETP which is a first, we've never had that before on the conventional market using a, a, an ETP wrapper where you can if, effectively participate in the performance of the inverse of Bitcoin um, when you feel that the market is going down. So this has been particularly good in the last couple of days because we, sh we saw a slight dip uh, three days ago and then it uh, suddenly came back. So now there is a choice for investors, particularly retail and institutional investors, to invest in conventional regulated product using crypto uh, currency as underlying and in a very normal conventional environment, which is the equity markets. And this just by using your conventional broker. So if you look at what these two issues have done, they've paved the way for the institutional markets to literally get a grip on the underlying assets within their portfolio, within their prime brokers, within their conventional uh, asset allocation, using these type of uh, vehicle, which are very much suited for these portfolios in a conventional environment. And this is exactly what we saw with the likes of the underlying assets such as gold, uh, some 16, 17 years ago that were issued by another commodities uh, ETF issuer in the UK. And now, obviously, you're starting to see more traction. You've mentioned the US issuer uh, that has gained a huge amount of assets, and that's great, and we want to see more. And we're hoping that in Europe, this is also going to attract a lot more European um, investors, particularly retail. The market is open. They just use their retail broker. And there's plenty out there that they can access. The products are available in various currencies. So you don't really get um, shaved by the FX rates that you would generally have if you're trading US dollar and your broker can only offer Euro euros or, or sterling or, um, or even Swiss francs. So these products have got a, a very good mix. And there's various... Um, uh, themes available. You can have a basket and you can have various other crypto assets. So um, I, I think we're, we're just scratching the surface in terms of getting assets invested in, um, in these uh, products. And with now this um, um, uh, uh, split, uh, sorry, with this uh, halving, I'm hoping that we were going to get a lot more retail uh, interest and people are going to start getting more involved in these um, in these products. F fabulous. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. Um, it is so exciting to see so many different types of products coming out, uh, including the, the short Bitcoin uh, ETP that, that you recently launched. Um, very innovative. And and on the on the note of innovation in, in this space, um, 
we're extremely excited to have Mona with us, um, who has uh, created a, a decentralized fund management platform based on Ethereum. Uh, but I won't say any more. Uh, Mona, please, can you uh, give us an introduction to, to yourself and, and what you do in, in the space? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for having me here. It's uh, really exciting um, participating in the event, events around this kind of big event. Um, the happening. Um, we got into the space uh, just over three years ago. We, uh, we, you know, we sort of um, saw Ethereum and we saw um, the potential for all these new types of assets uh, to be issued on Ethereum. And the one kind of um, conviction I had back then was the future is tokenized, whether that's, uh, you know, crypto assets to start, but in future equities, bonds, anything you can think of really that has a value um, will be tokenized because why not? It's, um, you know, every single metric that you measure um, anything by in finance, it's much more efficient, it's faster, it's immediate settlement. You know, it, it, for me, it's, this part is not non-questionable. Um, but the but the interesting kind of afterthought that came was, well, if everything is going to be tokenized, then why do we have to rely on such uh, archaic financial infrastructure? Um, because anyone who understands kind of the back office, middle office engines of how finance works knows that it's a terribly inefficient, expensive um, process. But it's, you know, for good reasons, because until now, we've never had... Um, ways of ensuring trust between counterparties other than those of financial intermediaries. Um, however, now we do have alternative means of uh, in establishing trust between two parties or between multiple parties. Um, and that's, you know, that's a technology enforcement, that's blockchain technology. Um, and so what we thought is, well, wow, if, um, if you have all this kind of functionality, um, if you if you have a tokenized future, then essentially you can kind of encode all the uh, all kind of operational administrative uh, functionality that a financial intermediary would usually do. So what we do is we basically automate asset management protocol. We enable um, the same level of trust between counterparties, except without the financial intermediaries in the middle. Uh, very importantly, investors in any of the um, kind of decentralized products that are built on our protocol always have full custody of their assets at all time. They are very unconventional in that sense. <laughs> um, but um, my belief is if you really want to diversify a portfolio, then in order to achieve that full diverse, diverse, diversity, you also want to ensure um, a complete uh, lack of correlation between the traditional finance um, financial sector and the blockchain financial sector, because they the risks. Um, you know, the risk is that if if so, if something systemic happens in traditional finance, and you're invested in a traditional version of a crypto product, then that may suffer too. Um, but if you're wholly, you know, in full custody of an asset on on blockchain and no one else owns it but you, then you will always. Um, you know, you will sort of be hedged against that event. And for me, that's the real value of these uh, pure crypto tokens. Now, when we start to enter, uh, you know, things like tokenized equity and tokenized cars and tokenized art, that's a different story. But crypto in the pure sense, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a self-custody story. Um, so anyway, we built um, Melon, the asset management protocol. It's the first fully decentralized asset management protocol to hit the mainnet. Uh, it also became the first protocol, or we became the first team to fully decentralize its governance. And we're now continuing development and taking it from a V1.0 to a V2.0 gradually. Um, trying to make it easier to use, we're trying to in improve the functionality, increase the feature set. Um, and um, and we're starting to see some really good feedback on that, but it's still very early days. And I granted, <laughs> I'm very aware that what we're doing is very cutting edge, and um, and um, and uh, you know probably not as user friendly as some of the solutions, um, the other solutions being talked about here today. It's certainly getting there, and um, I just I think it's I find it quite confusing to describe Melon because. You know, it was avant-garde, um, and you led that, and then you you decentralized it. So you kind of you kind of question yourself whether was it built by yeah. Anyone? So no, it was actually Melonport. Uh, it was Melonport, the company that built Melon, and then we dissolved Melonport after we decentralized the governments. Okay, you so 
Yeah. 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 So avant garde is actually relatively new, and we applied for the lead developer position a few months ago. But we're not the only project <coughs> now building on Melon. It's kind of open for anyone to build on. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, really, really fascinating. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about the, you know, what, the bit that you said about if the traditional financial system goes boom, then you know these instruments, um, Lahorn, sorry to, to point fingers, but some, some, some of these instruments would also be at risk. Um, I think we'll hear from Danny Masters later about his approach to that in putting uh, tokenized gold on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. But you know, similarly, exactly in line with what you, you guys are doing, is is creating that true decentralization in, in the fund management and digital assets, um, and it's it's really exciting project. Um, so then, sort of passing the the baton over to our uh, third um, panelist on on this first section, um, Mr. James Bowater, who I must say has done an absolutely fantastic job of boosting. Uh, we're here in London today, um, this, the, the capital city of, of the UK, um, boosting the profile for digital assets. Uh, today is their second birthday of the Crypto Insider, which goes out in the City AM, I believe, uh, fortnightly in a double page spread. Uh, James, would you like to introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about sort of how you've, how you've driven the digital asset space forward in, in, in London? Yeah, I'm probably have to put Luna down now, but she's getting a little bit. Frustrated. Oh, you can keep her. We'll dogs are allowed. And if I yell, if I yell, it's uh, my fault. Anyway, um, no thanks, uh, James. Uh, I'm certainly not as as knowledgeable as my um, esteemed co-panelists. Uh, I came into this uh, space, gosh, I, as you said, two years ago. Although the, the the actual birthday is the 18th of June. Today's sort of the anniversary of, of joining City AM in partnership to create Crypto AM. Um, but I, I came in with zero knowledge, um, and I declared that at the beginning. I'm not a journalist either, uh, and that would be incredibly unfair on any other journalist in City AM if I said that. Um, I guess what I do is, well, what I, well, what I set out to do is to educate uh, the audience as I learnt. Um, and the only way to learn is to actually get out there and show up. And as I think you'll probably attest to, I've been to literally every single possible um, meeting of everything that, um, that you can imagine. Although, having said that, I did accidentally get involved um, in, in, in the creation of a stablecoin back in 2014 without really knowing what that was. But it was a, a, a gold-backed um, thing called the... Um, Hope Gold Coin, and it was underpinned by um, the asset, so the, the in-ground reserves of a New York Stock Exchange quoted um, uh, oh. mining business. Stop it, didn't it? Anyway, so it, 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 it resonated in the back of my mind, and then I was also involved in, 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 in the area of authentication. So, of course, blockchain is transparency, trust, and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, digital Digitization is... is Creating more, uh, creating a more frictionless environment, um, enabling you know twenty four seven trading. You know markets don't close, and there's always that you know stuff going on. <clears throat> but um, two years is 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 an astonishingly long time in in this business now. I mean, I think they call it in dog years. Forgive um, <laughs> um, sort of ten years for every one, isn't it? So it's going to feel like. James, you have you have by far and away done more events, I think, than all of us put together. So you know, you came in when this industry had peaked at its sort of uh, mass kind of retail acknowledgement ever in its history, and the last two years has been somewhat of a consolidation, a consolidation in our understanding, you know, of different tokens, um, of of Bitcoin and how how central it is, uh, and and of course in the price. So, I mean, how have you seen the last sort of two years? as you've been going to these events and, and speaking to all the people that you have, the different cities across Europe, do you think we're moving in, a, in, a, in the right direction? You know, or well, are we I, moving? I, I, I really do. And actually, I mean, it's interesting that you say that I came into it at that sort of heady time of actually what was probably the worst possible thing to happen, which was all this sort of uh, Wild West craziness. Um, and seeing these bright young kids raising masses of money and then being... Uh, not necessarily advised terribly well or just not really paying much attention, intermingled with um, out-and-out scam artists, uh, gave the whole 
thing a really bad reputation. Um, I, 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 I persevered because I think um, the, it's the underlying technology that's actually quite interesting and that the, the journey is only really just beginning. Um, and I think, um, and I think you've got Dominic Frisbee on another panel. I, I remember uh, I, I turned up at, um, I think it was a coin geek uh, thing where he was speaking and he was giving a, a sort of parallel about on the, the, the various bubbles. And there's absolutely no way that we're, we are in a bubble yet. And I think that he said that, um, uh, that all the, the previous bubbles had been um, uh, a, a, a multiple of the S&P 500 in order for us to be a bubble that we'd have to be in the trillions of dollars. So I think we really are completely at the beginning. And, and the other thing that I've noticed is that because of the media hype and the interest, the, the, the whole blockchain thing stimulated a, a bunch of people doing projects that weren't needed and weren't ready. Um, and I think it all comes down to the need for regulation, not, 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 um, not to stifle uh, technological advancement, but to actually protect both the project um, drivers and, and also the people that they're interacting with. Absolutely. It, it's, it's, Absolutely. It, it's what I've really enjoyed seeing um, over the last two years is actually how um, the bad actors are being kind of, you know, washed out. And, and that tends to happen in any unregulated space, I think, because unregulated spaces attract Wild West. It didn't mean that crypto per se was bad or blockchain was bad. It was just that because it was unregulated, unscrupulous people could, you know, get involved and, and, and try and, frankly, just scan the money out. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen plenty of examples. The regulation yeah. makes, it, yeah. makes a big difference. Sorry. If I can, um, I just want to pass back to uh, Mr. Laurent on that point. I mean, the, the regulation, it, it really makes a difference. Um, do we need, when we're looking at financial products and what's available, do we need an ETF in order to be... Um, considered sort of truly regulated Laurent or is an ETP or sort of a different variation of an exchange traded product so a note um, so about the same thing yeah I mean the the ETP um, is an umbrella of words that obviously uh, highlights or describes many many uh, um, uh, vehicle uh, obviously it's exchange traded instrument product vehicle and behind there there's obviously a lot more that uh, people need to be uh, worried or concerned in terms of a risk factor. And, you know, everyone talks about the Bitcoin ETF in the US. We have an equivalent in Europe. We've got two and they are working very well. They've been around now for quite some time. And it's just a question of how you want to expose the underlying uh, instrument within that product. Uh, they're not funds at least in Europe, and certainly not in the US, there would be trust. Um, and obviously, how do you position them in a regulated environment? How do you give them more integrity? And of course, you know, you can have your usual Cayman um, BVI uh, registered companies that can issue offshore vehicles, and that doesn't attract a lot of uh, a retail investor. Or you can go onshore and attract a lot more investors within conventional and totally understandable um, uh, environments that people are comfortable with, such as, for instance, the ETF world in Dublin. Uh, most of the ETF are, reg are registered there. You've got a lot uh, in terms of retail registered in Luxembourg. We decided to um, uh, register ours in Switzerland. They can be passported. And then within, obviously, a regulatory framework, you can distribute this product throughout Europe. Now, of course, um, these products, we don't stop them from being accessible throughout the world, but we state clearly, and this is why when we use the term regulated, there is a prospectus that exactly talks about the risk factor that everyone should be defined and, and looking at. And this is what, for instance, you've been seeing in the last um, couple of weeks with the oil markets where people have been buying so-called oil products and they're not actually reflecting uh, these 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 uh, underlying assets whereas you know with an oh, can I stop you sorry because we're, we're coming into the end of the segment I, I, I was waiting for you to pause for breath i just wanted to point behind you it says it says cyprus bad cut is that referring to your haircut <laughs> i would fail out i thought it said 
Side yeah. bad card. I thought it was, I thought it was a advert for a barber looking at your No, so I use Cyprus bailout because if you remember on the last I do. I do. on the last uh, uh, evening, that was some of the causes why people actually moved in and why people invested in crypto. So that was actually one of the main reasons why after the halving, people put a lot of money in cryptos. Absolutely. Um, Charlie Charlie is desperate to have his uh, session, so we will be moving on very shortly. But before we do that, before we do that, I would like to conclude with a quick fire round. Um, this, is a, this is a 20 seconds uh, and you will be cut off by the buzzer. The question is, is regulated crypto an oxymoron? Can you have regulated crypto? Um, we'll start with, with Mona. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I mean, that, that's kind of two part. Basically, um, yes and no. I mean, I, I'm going to have to say yes and no. I think it's possible to, to, I think it's possible for both worlds to be in parallel. I don't think why not. Yes. Like okay. anything else, by the way. Like anything else. Uh, yeah. Laurent, would you? Well, you, you know, you look at gold, it's unregulated. Currency are unregulated. You know, most of the underlying assets are unregulated. So why can you not have a Bitcoin ETF, ETP in the market? So I think it's not an oxymoron. There is a lot of scopes out there. We're, we're actually only copying what people have done in the past, using crypto and making it easy for everyone to access. Okay. And uh, James, last word from you, if you're, if you're still with us. Okay, he may have stepped away. In which case, on that, can we have regulation in Bitcoin? Hello. Oh, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, did, I did the mute thing. I thought I'd actually pushed it. No, I'm, I, I was going to agree. That, yeah, I was, going, I was going to agree that it absolutely can coexist, and that regulation is is necessary as long as it doesn't stifle progress technology. Yeah, absolutely. Fabulous. Okay, Mona, James, Lohan, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand it over to Charlie for his segment. And um, Charlie, over to you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. So thank you, everyone. Bye. Great show. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Now, can you silence the mark? Silence that last panel. We will never hear from them again, particularly Laurent. And no more French people on the show. So, um, I welcome, I'm going to welcome Paul Gordon. Uh, who, who's well known to the London um, blockchain community. Dominic Frisby, who's well known um, or in financial circles as the author of Money Week and who wrote the book Bitcoin. And John Matonis, who's, who's world famous in Bitcoin, who was a, a founding member of the Bitcoin Foundation. So we've actually got Bitcoin royalty on the show as well, uh, uh, today. In fact, we've got, we've, we've got the entire royal family in front of us, um, which, is, which is pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> They went. Somebody lost some hair, though. Yes, yeah. Well, I'm afraid. <laughs> not, not you, Paul. <laughs> In fact, John, you've got by far the most hair of all. <laughs> well, let's hope it stays that way. Yeah. Well, look. Before I, I'm going to dig into to, to our topics, we had quite a good question um, about what happened the other night. Can it, has anyone got a thought about, I know this is short term, we don't speculate too much on, on little price moves, but who's got a thought? And just raise your hand and, and, and speak if you, if you well, want to go yeah, first. Well, yeah, I'll start off. I mean, the it's whole thing night. for me... Night. It's Saturday night. The, the whole thing for me kind of reminded me a little bit of um, uh, the way New Year's Eve is for me. It's very anticlimactic. You know, you're sitting around, you're waiting and you're waiting, um, and then nothing really changes and you go to bed. Um, and it happens every four years instead of every one year. I like it. I like it. So there's a bit of the hype in advance of it, and, and then it, you know there's nothing to. to but I to will. Think. I will. I will add one thing though, Charlie. Is I think the next uh, hardening that we have in four or more years, we will we will actually see it uh, simulcast on CNBC and Bloomberg. So you'll be out of a job. And I thought we'd have that this time. I was actually shocked. I was looking at the front page of the Financial Times today. No halving anywhere. Where was right, it? Right, right. Paul, do you have a view on this? I've never heard him speak so much sense in my entire life. Sorry, there you go. Thank you, John. Thank you. No, I th um, thank you. Uh, no, I just find it a little bit bizarre, really. I mean, people talk about supply shock, and you couldn't have the, uh, the a more telegraphed supply shock in, in in the history of anything. It was kind of telegraphed eleven years ago when the code was written that it was coming. 
um, and it would happen at this time or roughly at this time every four years. Um, you know, I think the big question mark has always been, does it impact and more so in the last two halves, which probably in the first one in terms of how it impacts the miners and what it would do to the hash rate and essentially the security of the network. Um, fortunately, this time we had a virtual halving by the price crashing virtually overnight a few weeks ago. Um, so that tested the miners and um, it forced quite quickly forced some of the more inefficient ones off the network. So we saw the hash rate dropped about 25 to 30%. It coped, it survived. The network's still pretty secure with, uh, you know, 90 exa hashes rather than 120 exa hashes of, uh, uh, of power behind it. Um, so I don't know. I think it, it's good. It's fun, but I, you know, at the end of the day, it's designed. Bitcoin's designed and it's proven itself robust to cope with all these things. It's designed to be able to accommodate drops in hash rate as well as rises in hash rate, uh, and to maintain the incentives for miners. So you know, it should be just business as usual. Uh, nothing broke. That's the good thing. Um, we can just carry on. That's the brilliance of the design, isn't it? You know, you've got something for the for the financiers, you've got something for the workers, and you've got something for the uh, for the free market. Um, John, do you, do you mind just telling me more about you know your your founding role in the Bitcoin Foundation, what that meant, and and, and how you've enjoyed the last decade? What well, sure. The the Bitcoin Foundation uh, originally was uh, founded in 2012, and it was a group of uh, five of us originally. The original funders uh, were Roger Ver and um, the Mt. Gox team. That, that's what originally launched the foundation, and. The purpose at that time in 2012 was primarily to fund the core development team. The, the core development team was volunteers uh, at that time, uh, worried about leaving jobs and not getting paid because they're doing Bitcoin work. So uh, as an original objective, uh, that, that, that's very noble. And in doing that, we were able to attract uh, Gavin Andreessen um, we, we were not able to get all of the developers. Uh, I don't think you would want to get all of the developers. But in, in that original launch plan, uh, the climate at the time was such that uh, the people in the Bitcoin community were a little bit worried about uh, outside influence in the development community. So an attempt was made uh, in, in signing up developers and compensating developers through the foundation that they would also have to reveal and disclose any other sources of funding. If they were getting sources of funding from uh, other states, other governments to, to work on Bitcoin. Um, so, so that was done and that was accomplished. Uh, one of the early things that the funding for the Bitcoin Foundation also did was when there was a fork that occurred uh, back in, um, I believe it would have been late 2012 or 2013, uh, because of a change in the database structure, uh, we actually had a fork that went on for uh, about four or five blocks before it was detected and reversed. Um, <clears throat> we used the network alert system at that time to get uh, messaging out to all of the clients so that everyone would be able to switch to the correct fork uh, when, the, when the messaging alert system was still in use back then. But the funds for the foundation compensated all of the miners that had mined on the fork that was abandoned. Because when you have a, a legitimate uh, bug in the system where it's, it's nobody's fault on which way is forking, um, you choose a side, but you have to remember that there have been uh, you know, minor commitments to the side of the fork that was abandoned. And these people were saying, well, what about our mining fees? What about our compensation? And it has to be a neutral player like the foundation that uh, has the ability to come in there and compensate uh, the, the miners for, for that abandoned port. Well, um, thanks for that, John. I want to bring in Dominic here because you're a bit of an old timer. Dominic, when was, your, when was your first involvement in Bitcoin? You wrote the book in 2014, um, but when, when did you first get involved? And what was your first, what was your first transaction, Dominic? Well, my first transaction was a chap called um, Johnny Bitcoin, who gave me some Bitcoins. And this would have been, I want to say 2011. So it was very early on. Um, but I know that the first time I heard about Bitcoin 
was in December 2010 because I wanted to, I did, a, I, I did some, res, I, I signed up for this um, weird newsletter for people who want to escape the system way back in about 2008. And this um, letter, uh, and it, it was called, it was called the captain's log or something like that. And he used to write about, you know, ways you can get passports in Panama and things like that. And then he mentioned this new digital currency and he quoted an article that was in, of all places, PC World. You know, PC World, where you go and buy your computers, curries, I think it's now called. And like, for some reason, PC World magazine was one of the first people to write about Bitcoin. And it mentioned this article in this new digital currency system that's beyond the control of governments and you can send cash across the internet and yada, yada. And I looked at the price when um, this article came out and it was f for, of a Bitcoin. And what's Bitcoin today? Nine thousand dollars, eight and a half thousand dollars. The price of a Bitcoin was four cents. How about that? And uh, unfortunately, I didn't buy and I should have gone, gone all in with a hundred pounds and I'd be a trillionaire now. But anyway, and then but the, the first actual transaction was this chat who went to, by the name of Johnny Bitcoin. His real name's Johnny Harrison. And he was a real, it was funny how Bitcoin attracted these people in the early days. And it always has where there are people who genuinely want to reform the system. And um, it's one of these things when you buy your, first, and, and Johnny Bitcoin lived in a squat in East London with Amir Taki, who was a famous hacker. And Johnny had followed the stuff I'd written about gold. And so he was trying to get me into Bitcoin and he gave me some Bitcoins to try and get me hooked on the thing. And um, but Bitcoin attracts these sort of advocates who, you know, they want to change the system. They, they think fiat money is evil. They hate all the inequality fiat money creates. They hate central banking. Fiat money gives governments too much power, all that stuff. And so people kind of you know, invest in Bitcoin, they transact in it, and then they start becoming advocates. And Johnny was a great champion. Johnny um, was like getting me to introduce him to people like Douglas Carswell and Steve Baker, who were both MPs in the House of Commons at the time, and trying to get me to put him in touch so that he could give them some Bitcoins. And people just used to give them away. Um, there was another chap called Brian Cartmel, who was a, uh, who's now, who was very early on to the COVID crisis and was sending me emails back in January telling me to run and hide in the um, in the countryside. But he's locked himself up somewhere in New Zealand very <laughs> remotely. And uh, he's not he's got a year's worth of supplies. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, he's hiding in New Zealand. And Brian was another guy who knew me. He, he crowdfunded a couple of things that I'd done. And um, he was giving me some bitcoins as well very early on in the day. So so it was literally people giving them away that, 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 that got that got me started. Well, I was going to come back to John, but we've just got a technical issue on him. So I'm going to go straight to Paul. Now, Paul, I'm going to put you a question I was hoping to ask you um, shortly. You, you understand the technical side of how the blockchain works. And, and just before halving, um, we were on block 998, um, which took ages to go through. And one of them about 10 minutes, uh, 10 blocks before that took th over 30 minutes. And then the last block took, um, took, took seconds. This is a question that's come through from, from, um, from some watching live. And um, why do some blocks take ages and some block take, blocks take seconds? Uh, it's purely based on randomness. So, um, you know, the, the network was designed to issue blocks roughly every 10 minutes. Um, but that's only going to be roughly 10 minutes. Um, and the way those blocks are essentially issued or found by the miners is by them entering a lottery, a permanent lottery. Uh, which essentially begins and ends every time a, a new block is found. Um, the network calculates uh, just by a simple kind of moving average of how, how frequently blocks are being found. And after a two-week period, um, if they're being found more frequently than 10 minutes, every 10 minutes on average, um, it basically adjusts the number that the miners have to guess in this lottery to try and win a block. And when they, they're incentivized to win a block because they're rewarded with the newly minted Bitcoins which come along with each block. Um, but that is, is purely based on random numbers. And, you know, just like any lottery, like there's the odd guy that's won the lottery twice, which, you know, the odds of that are just ridiculous, but it happens. 
um, you know, uh, um, two miners, the same miner or two different miners can literally, we've had times where in a block, uh, there's been a gap between a block that might have been 40. I think the, the record's about four hours. So purely on natural variance and randomness, it could potentially take four hours, it could potentially take two seconds between blocks. But over time, on average, um, the network, you know, sets its difficulty, if people have heard about like difficulty setting, um, to a point that on average it will take roughly 10 minutes per block to be found. And that's right. why we actually, and that's also why sometimes, you know, it should be every four years, but if hash power is um, increasing rapidly, um, actually, you know, the, the block times on average could, you know, um, could uh, even out to be, say, nine minutes and halving could actually happen sooner than expected. Which is why we're doing this show to, today, not on the 4th of January 2021. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> <Is that right? laughs> exactly. But, um, can I just quickly... Can I, can I, can I can move on? Sorry, Paul, we'll come back to you. That, I mean, the system is just is so beautiful, the way it's designed and the way that there were so few or no, or no errors... Um, you know, the design just sort of works for everyone. It's something I, 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 just, I can never quite um, get my head around. It's, all, it, it's wonderful. Now, I'm going to come back to, to, to John. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the fact, you know, privacy is a big thing for you, isn't it? And also you talk about um, coin hygiene. Now, obviously, with the virus going around, then hygiene is very important. What do you mean by co coin hygiene? Could you talk about that, please? Uh, and tell us your thoughts on the importance of privacy um, on the Internet. Right, right. In, in the larger uh, uh, picture, um, I think we're seeing a, uh, the evolving of a crypto arms battle. Uh, and, in, you know, in a crypto arms race, you're going to have the financial surveillance uh, teams that are uh, on one side and you're going to have the, the, the proponents of privacy on the other side. Um, we, we have the privacy proponents must prevail in this crypto arms race. It's it's not guaranteed, but it's 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 a cat and mouse game. So every time you have a advancement on the surveillance side, you'll have an advancement on the privacy side, and and, and vice versa. It's a little bit like the uh, arms race that the U.S. had with with Russia during the Cold War, and and, that, and that's why I call it an arms race. Um, <clears throat> the implications for the users, however, and the implications for the network are uh, far more important because you you must retain the privacy of transactions to maintain the system fungibility and the fungibility will become an economic necessity within the bitcoin network so we we are kidding ourselves if we think that we'll be able to continue with bitcoin in the future uh, in the absence of privacy I, I remember your last segment here was talking about regulated bitcoin versus unregulated bitcoin uh, we already have regulated Bitcoin because any exchange transaction is regulated Bitcoin. Uh, I, you know, you, you turn over more information to an exchange than you do to your bank. Um, where it differs and where we have unregulated Bitcoin is in the transactions that uh, ha happen between individuals or businesses that are outside of any exchange transactions. And for those transactions to continue, uh, it will soon become an economic necessity that there's privacy with those transactions. We don't have to achieve privacy at the exchange transaction level as long as we achieve privacy at the peer-to-peer, person-to-person transaction level, because that's what we're competing against. We're competing against uh, uh, bearer instruments like cash, where for that system to continue, it also has to have the elements of privacy. Um, it has to have the three main elements of privacy that Bitcoin is actually giving you uh, in the electronic form of cash. There's no new privacy elements that are being created. They're just privacy elements that we've always had with paper cash. You have user-defined um, privacy. You're the one who can set that level. You have um, transaction irreversibility. And you have um, uh, transaction confidentiality. So the, those elements we have with paper cash, uh, what Bitcoin does is allow you to have that in the electronic world. The point is that it's not a luxury and it's not going to be optional. It will actually become an economic necessity in the system uh, and, and it will decide and determine the reaction from the authorities will, will determine whether or not we have uh, an above ground Bitcoin system or, or an underground Bitcoin system but we will always have a, a Bitcoin system. 
Now, taking it one step further, you have uh, you know Cypherpunk Holdings, which is the publicly traded company in Canada. Which, which was my next question. A privacy protocol investment company, which needs to be on your list, Charlie, for uh, uh, publicly traded uh, uh, crypto companies. I, I think it's you're on my list. On your list. All right. Well, let's get that updated on your list. Um, <clears throat> and two of the early investments we made there were in the wallets that are supporting the CoinJoin protocol. Uh, number one, Samurai Wallet and and Wasabi Wallet. Um, currently, the CoinJoin protocol is the uh, you know de facto uh, leading protocol for for Bitcoin uh, for for Bitcoin coin mixing on the internet, and that's why we selected those two initial companies. Others will follow this. You you have Join Market out there that is a uh, uh, you know, a, a, an open source uh, project that is not affiliated with a specific wallet. Um, and I believe that you will have others that follow in this uh, paradigm as well. Um, it will become so easy that it'll eventually get to the point where users that are using their wallets, either primarily on their mobile phones, I think, but uh, desktop as well, where you won't even know that this is occurring. It will become a uh, it will become a default feature that's standard on a lot of wallets, and it's an issue that that must be addressed. I want to stay on the topic of uh, the topic of, um, uh, of privacy because I think it's one that that does get overlooked. We're so obsessed by price, and I think that, that you know to look at you know why, why this thing's important in, in, is is important. So I'm going to ask Paul that, but I'm also going to ask Dominic first. So Dominic, tell me your thoughts on. I know you're also linked, by the way, with Cypherpunk um, Holdings. I'm the so former CEO, that. Charlie. Are you, are you still the CEO? No, no. Uh, the, the company is currently without a CEO. I had to stand down last couple of months ago due to um, just uh, uh, family difficulties. And um, and the, the company has yet to replace me. Oh, well, you know. Irreplaceable. You're a job out there. There's a, there's a <laughs> top job in, um, in South Park. I'll Park take Park. it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, there you go. You got word hired. 10%, please. <laughs> now, uh, Dominic, tell us your thoughts on you know what, what you're trying to do there and, and, and your vision for, for privacy and the importance of it. Well, it was me that, like, somebody approached um, me uh, and they had a shell in Canada and he wanted it and it was, he wanted to turn it into some kind of bit, Bitcoin vehicle. And, um, and I was saying, well, there's no point just buying Bitcoins and holding them in the company because sooner or later there's going to be a Bitcoin ETF, at which point this company model becomes redundant. Um, what you should do is invest in privacy technology. And, you know, that's obviously closely related to Bitcoin. And there are we, John and I, and, an, and another chap called Mo Adam were on the investment committee and we identified um, seven different categories of privacy technology. Um, but the reason I wanted to, you know, I, it, was, it was me that had this idea of being this privacy tech investment vehicle and i was just having breakfast one day or lunch one day with john and i said what do you think of this and john was instantly like i want to join and um so john joined as chief economist but i'm just convinced that with and with this covid crisis the need for it is even greater because there's that privacy is going to be like every bull market needs a narrative you know you think of the great commodities bull market of of the noughties, it was all about China growth and, and you know, dot com, the internet was going to change the world. And I'm, I'm convinced there's going to be a huge bull, mar bull market in privacy. You know, we, we, we know more and more about how Facebook knows this about you and Google knows this about you and Apple knows this about you. And people sort of shake their head and wonder. But when that information falls into bad hands or is used against you in some way, suddenly, we're going to realize that we've given our privacy away without even realizing it. And so I just think uh, over the course of this decade, privacy is just going to be a huge narrative. And, you know, the, the default setting of the Internet is that you hand your privacy away for nothing. And I think as time moves by, more and more people are going to start paying a premium to protect their privacy. And so there's going to be a huge bull market in in technologies that, that you know, aid the protection of privacy. And, you know, Bitcoin has a huge role to play in that. Bitcoin mixers have a huge role to play in that. But also other things like, you know, VPNs. VPNs have seen extraordinary growth in the last few years. 
And, you know, there's just so much data about you and how much data do you really want shared? So I just think there's an extraordinary narrative around privacy. Dominic, thank you very much. And, and then I'm just going to wrap up with a, uh, I've got one magic question for you. So you, you three of you, so you've got to, you've got to wait for that. It's a quick fire round and it's, and I'll give you a warning. It's about plan B's model, uh, the stock flow model. So you've got to give me a quick answer. And, uh, but, but Paul, what, what have you got to say about the whole, the whole subject of privacy? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, both John and Dominic touched on some very pertinent points. So it's, uh, it's one of being, being that open question. Now, I, I mean, and I agree with them, you know, there's, but I think maybe it's also worth kind of considering being careful about what you kind of, you're throwing out with the bathwater. I mean, privacy is obviously really important. I think it is coming into the public meme, you know, the, the, the contact tracing apps that Facebook and Google are put, putting out. You know, I think I've heard the term decentralization mentioned four oh or five God, times on terrifying. Radio 4. On, on tech, but it is. But I mean, they are pitching it as the idea that the data is owned by the user. I mean, whether it's true or not, and whether we have the you know oversight of them, that's a different question. I mean, with open source models, at least they can be kind of vetted. Um, but you know, the it's, at least it's coming into public consciousness. So they're saying, no, you own your data. It's not going to a central database. And this is a conversation that in our world we've been having for many years now. And this is being had as a conversation on Radio 4. So I think that's really interesting. That's how it seeps into the public psyche. Uh, so whether it's the big corporations which deliver those products to us or whether that's the opportunity for the innovators within our, in our world to do it properly uh, and make sure it's secure. Um, so that's an interesting you know, uh, facet to what the, to the general conversation that's emerging. Um, in terms of like, you know, we're tracing, we talk about um, it's a common theme of regulated, unregulated. And John mentioned it's an ongoing game of cat and mouse, which is always fascinating because these like, operate like natural systems. And, you know, you've got viruses nipping at the edges of all of these services or protocols and they find faults and you've got kind of live bounties where if I, someone kind of a victorious hacker breaks into a smart contract and gets away with a bounty or breaks into an exchange, you know, generally the world moves on and um, the community and the ecosystem learns from it and strengthens itself. So that's all very positive. Um, but it's always said that, you know, the, the money itself or the money layer needs to be private to maintain, you know, that level of privacy and uh, anonymity for the user. But I quite, you know, it's always said that the money chase, like, is the money dirty? You know, what's the history of the money? Now, for me, like the money itself is a dumb object, whether it's a, you know, uh, 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 you know a, pound note, a pound coin. Right. It's the person. It's the identity. So this is maybe the more worrying thing. So there's still an argument that you might want privacy on chain. Um, but there's also potentially an argument that there's an opportunity around having a certain level of open information which could bring more equality into, into kind of the economic system. Whereas, you know, if you think about most... You know, inequality within the financial system is because of information asymmetry where, you know, banks or someone might have privileged information. So, you know, that's one thing to consider. But the other thing I think worrying in the broad picture now is something like Facebook and Libra. I mean, you know, it purports itself to be a stable coin, essentially, but from the beginning, baked into its design was identity. And that is going to be an identity system which sits upon its own token, its own currency. But I can see you know, legislators, regulators saying, well, you've got to be using one of these identity wallets to send any crypto transaction. Sure, go ahead and use Bitcoin, but it's got to be going, you know, you've got to be handing your identity around with it. And that will just become another question of like, you know, whether you're sitting within the bounds of the law or outside the bounds of the law. So that's going to be, you know, an interesting kind of divide to pursue. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you so much for spending the time um, on our panel and, and, and I wish you all a happy halving. Before you go, I just want you to do an, um, an Emperor Nero. Uh, uh, Mark, can you put everyone um, onto the screen, including James? Can you do, a, can you do an Emperor Nero? And, and I want you to do, um, um, yeah, everyone who's got a live camera, yeah, Emperor Nero. Now, Plan B's stock to flow model. Ready? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I don't understand the question, Charlie. I haven't been <laughs> listening to you. Follow me, Dominic. Follow me. I, come well, I usually do, Charlie, right. so I'll, I'll take you. I'll... Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to, um, to James. 
Brilliant. So uh, just on that last point that Paul made, I think it's it's a really good one, which is um, about privacy and, and digital currency. Larry Summers was just on uh, the CoinDesk distributed uh, event talking about the fact that you know, a, a digital dollar is is preferable um, only because it's more traceable. You know, for um, for the the treasury uh, and other and other government entities. Uh, so, really, really interesting topic that has come been coming at from both sides. Uh, so, now over to the next topic, um, the third slot of the evening. We're joined by uh, two wonderful guests on on slightly different sides of of the space, but we're talking about data. We're talking about research. Um, so, um, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Maximilian Engelin, who is a, a good friend and former business partner at, at Bitassist, um, who, who now leads up head of sales at Crypto Compare. Um, Max, would you like to give us a, a short intro on yourself and, and what you've done in the space? Sure. Uh, cheers, James. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I look after business development and, and sales at Crypto Compare. Um, we're the global leader when it comes to digital asset market data. Uh, prior to the role, as James suggested, I actually ran a startup with him for two years, which was a brilliant experience. Uh, prior to that, I actually stumbled across Bitcoin in 2013, uh, sitting in my bedroom in South Africa. Uh, I just got my first paycheck and I was like, what can I invest in as a 21-year-old? <clears throat> Found myself on Reddit and stumbled across Bitcoin. And ever since, I've been pretty much addicted to it, like I'm sure most of us are here. Um, you, didn't, you didn't buy a pizza, but you instead bought a... Um, well, I, I bought a suit <laughs> um, when I was in Thailand with, with way too much Bitcoin. Um, not necessarily directly with Bitcoin. I, I liquidated and then bought a, bought a suit. But anyway, I still got the suit. Um, I would have preferred the Bitcoin, but yeah. Last longer than the pizza. That's yeah. For sure. yeah. No, I'll hold on to that forever. But just what I do at Crypto Compare, so like I said, we're a market data provider um, and uh, we've been around since 2013. Uh, we stand for ultra reliable and uh, accurate market data. Um, one of your guests earlier works with us, actually two. Uh, Mona Lisa, uh, she uses our data as well as 21 shares uh, to build digital asset regulated products. If you need a regulated product, um, certainly our data is used in at least 95% of those. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, your thoughts on data in today's chat. Brilliant. Thanks for joining us, Max. And then um, on the other side, we have uh, Mr. Well, it's not a, it's not a wrestling <laughs> one in, in the other corner. So we have Mr. Torbjorn Bull Jensen, who is um, the CEO of Arcane. And I would say they currently do the best research uh, in crypto on this side of the pond. Um, I think Delphi is the, the kind of main competitor. So it's a real pleasure to have you on, Torbjorn. Uh, would you like Thank to you. give us a, a, bit of a, a bit of background on what you do and, and what you've done in the, in the crypto space? Yeah, no, so actually I'm the CEO of Arcane Crypto, uh, which sits atop Arcane Research. Uh, you can think of Arcane Crypto as a mini version of something similar to a digital currency group. We take an ecosystem perspective on investing in startups, but also starting companies ourselves. So we are invested in companies doing uh, algo trading, liquidity provision, uh, retail exchange. We have a hedge fund that we recently launched. Uh, we do the research, which is very close to my heart, since I used to work as a consultant earlier. Uh, and we also have a payment technology company focused on Lightning and uh, uh, kind of a managed version of something similar to B2C Pay. So my background is as, as an economist. I fell into the rabbit hole. I guess I fell into the hole in 2013, but I heard about Bitcoin in 2012 when a friend of mine told me to invest. I decided uh, that, I, sh <laughs> that uh, I should not invest. Uh, but at the time, I was studying economics at SOAS, University of London, where a lot of the kind of professors are focused on different schools of thought regarding the question of what is money. So I had a very keen interest in that. And uh, from there, it was very natural to start looking at how these theories apply to Bitcoin. I ended up doing my thesis on this uh in 2014 and been in the rabbit hole ever since that is fantastic uh, what was the title of your thesis uh, why bitcoin have value and why governments are skeptical so uh and i was um so actually very interesting because i went to my first bitcoin conference in 2013 in stockholm 
And I remember John had a presentation there where he drew the parallel to the uh, giant stones of uh, Yup, the rye stones. And uh, I took a lot of that inspiration with me in my master thesis, I drew a lot of uh, insights from uh, Nick Sabos shelling out the origins of money and very much identified money as a proof of work in general, actually, uh, but in a game theoretic sense. And, yeah. I remember that. I remember that. The uh, that's back in the KC minor days. Yeah, and, and the strange uh, thing was that I felt that it was so late uh, that I was so late uh, to the party. I felt like so uh, much had happened. So and the speed of development was so fast. So I felt. Yeah, no, you were so you were so early. It was very interesting that conference because the um, the regulator for the Swedish, I think it was the Swedish Financial Crimes Enforcement. He. Um, uh, he he had in his slide because he did a presentation as well, and he and then he was in the audience. But he had in his uh, slide like one of the quotes that I had given before on Bitcoin and governments, and he was including my quotes in his in his financial crime slides. Um, uh, and and so we we kept in touch, you know, ever since then. So I I think uh, it, it was important that he was learning it correctly. Brilliant. Yeah. So so um. Torbjorn, um, what is Bitcoin then? I mean, you talk about sort of trying to examine, you know, what, what Bitcoin is, how it had value back then. And there's been quite a lot of uh, developments, you know, in, in the thinking at least and, and the rhetoric in the, in the space. You know, what, what is Bitcoin to you um, and, and sort of how does it have value? How, how has that changed over, over the last six, seven years you've been in the space? Yeah, so to me, I would define it as a form of money because it is used as such. Uh, in certain situations. Uh, most critics who claim that it is not money tend to talk about uh, medium of exchange, uh, especially um, unit of account and store of value as if it's something absolute uh, and not related to the context you're in. I much more prefer defining money in terms of moneyness, its ability to buy, and that's uh, obviously dependent on the situation. My Norwegian kroner can buy me anything here in Norway. But you can't buy me, and but I cannot spend it outside of Norway. Is Norwegian kroner money? Well, obviously. Uh, is Bitcoin used to store value? Of course, it holds value all over time. Is it volatile? Yes, but so is a lot of other currencies. It is used for payment. Yes, we've used it ourselves in our game to pay freelancers uh, working from Nigeria. Uh, I used it to buy beer, uh, not liquidating it first, but actually buying the beer directly. And uh, is it used as a unit of account? Well, not very much uh, for normal uh, commerce, but it is on chain. And to be frank, the unit of account question is not the most important to me. Uh, why does it hold value? Well, uh, at the end of the day, to me, it holds its value because it solves ish problems that other monies cannot solve. Uh, that is both uh, the, uh, in the, its censorship resistance and its absolute scarcity. Uh, but also in its ability to transfer value across borders and long distances. It's the only digital bearer asset without any counterparty risk. All other forms of money, uh, digital money, is a claim on a counterparty, which means that if you want to transfer money through the banking system, you have to send it through what is called a correspondent banking system, because if I send money to the US, uh, my bank doesn't have a direct relationship with the bank of that merchant. So you have to have a chain of banks successively exchanging claims on each other. You could bypass that by sending a gold bar, but that's very cumbersome. But by sending the Bitcoin, the value is actually moved. And that's ex extremely transformational and to me, extremely powerful. That makes Bitcoin the most powerful kind of collateral asset. Uh, it's the only thing that can deliver real-time settlement or something close to real-time settlement across borders and geographies. Yes, yeah. It's come. A, it's certainly come a long way. It's an interesting point um, about being, you know, the only form of money that doesn't have counterparty risk. And then on the other hand, you know, we're having the sort of institutional trading landscape is coming, uh, moving more in the direction of having this sort of uh, layer two settlement and trading. So um, you're not actually holding or trading, you know, the asset yourself. You're just trading a, a sort of digital certificate on that asset um, because you know they want. Apparently, 10 minutes is, is too long um, in order to, to settle a trade, uh, which you'd have to wait at least you know, for one block on, on Bitcoin and, and then six confirmations. So 
And but, I, I, so the mention that so I think it's very important to realize that in situations where you do have trust, uh, for instance, within a country, uh, within a trading platform, uh, to leverage that and uh, settle your balances on that database uh, is potentially way more efficient than leveraging the trustless Bitcoin blockchain. So However, you if you're crossing and non -trust. Borders, yeah, but if you're if you need to cross trust borders, for instance, sending it over long distances to a jurisdiction where your local law doesn't help you at all, then uh, it's well worth using something like Bitcoin. And also with Lightning, you actually see derivatives trading, uh, leveraging Lightning deposits. Uh, I tested it uh, recently. Fabulous. So we'll come back to that um, shortly. Um, Maximilian, uh, I'd love to hear from you about you know how. So we've just had the Bitcoin halving. Uh, it's officially happened after four years. The last one was 2016. Um, there seems like there's a lot more going on in the space. You know, the price is higher. There are more users, more active addresses. Uh, there, are, there are definitely more people registered on platforms as Coinbase and Square. Do we see it in the exchange volume? You know, are people trading more these days uh, than they were in 2016? Yeah, um, roughly. Just to give you an idea of how far we've come since the last halvening or two halvenings ago now. Um, spot exchanges used to rarely exceed a billion dollars um, back in 2016. Now, in today's uh, market, we're, we regularly exceed 30 billion. Uh, so in, in a span of four years, we've 30x the volume. Um, a lot of people you know, are dying to see a trillion dollar Bitcoin market cap, if not more. Uh, you know, in four years' time, it's probably not that you know, hard to believe considering how much volume is increasing. And also now that we're seeing derivative exchanges, um, as Bjorn has just mentioned, that will integrate stuff like Lightning and of course become more and more regulated. We've seen the CME do crazy volumes um, since they started. Um, yeah, and I, I just think this landscape is pretty much unrecognizable since 2016, uh, when you look at Bitcoin volume or, or exchange volume. I mean, you mentioned derivatives. We've seen, you know, uh, BitMEX used to be the, the kingpin, and now we've got the likes of Bybit um, coming through. So, you know, what, what is the Bitcoin options uh, market sort of telling us about? Um, what, did we, were there any signals up until halving, and, and has it behaved differently around halving and, and after halving? Um, well, when you look at derivatives, um, there's not so many options derivatives exchanges right now. So Deribit own about, I think, like 80% of the market when it comes to options trading. Um, typically in traditional um, trading, options traders usually are very well informed. They're quite a complex um, you know, asset to trade. But um, if we were to look at the options um, leading up to the halvening, uh, there was a higher uh, strike premium um, on Deribit, um, showing that the options players thought there was more of a downside risk uh, than a potential upside risk. Uh, the last snapshot that we looked at was the 3rd of May, um, and uh, you know, a few days prior to the halvening, people that were betting on options uh, saw more of a possibility for us to lose value than gain value um, going into the, into the halvening, which uh, I think they settle in three days' time. Uh, the next options for Deribit on the 15th of May. Um, so anyways, it's still a very, you know, um, novice sector when it comes to options trading. I, I, I can't wait to, for four years' time how much data we will have on options and uh, how much insight it will give us into, you know, market movements. Um, but yeah, we've come a long way. Derivatives are great for price discovery and also for research. So... Do we know where the volume, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do we know where the volume sits between the sort of total options uh, market and the, and, and the spot? What, uh, options, o options, volume? Options, derivatives, any, anything sort of non-spot versus spot. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. So we just did our exchange um, review. For oh, no, I think we lost it. <laughs> Lost? Oh. Uh, sorry, no, I'm just I'm just checking the, the actual um 
Can you guys still hear me? I've been given a notification that my network's unstable. We can hear you. You came okay. back. Nice. Um, yeah, so I think, like, from what I can see, it, only 28% of the volume in April um, was from derivatives uh, markets. But prior to that, we've seen it as high as 40% sometimes. Okay. Uh, but volumes. But, but options, options is tiny. Volume. Like, options is, like, less than a percent um, of overall volume. Right. Okay. Well, that's good to see. I mean, there's still a, a large spot sort of uh, market um, in, in the space. Uh, it just it just strikes me that, you know, these big volatile price moves like the one we saw on the 12th of March, the one we saw yeah. a few days ago, is because, uh, you know, and, and I think Paul Gordon uh, alluded to it yesterday, is that during these sort of price uh, ranges, we've essentially got um, just a, a huge amount of, of option and derivatives trading and, and the, the kind of spot market, so the hodlers, um, you know, are, are quite well based um, below the, the 8,000 8, mark. Um, mm. So essentially there aren't many buyers and sellers during this uh, range between 8 and, and 12K, um, but, you know, there, there is quite a lot of options trading going on. But there's a lot of volatility in this range, right? There's a lot of great, great money to be made in between 8 and 10 grand. And, uh, and, and to be lost. So, and yeah. to be lost. <laughs> yeah. so zooming out, uh, zooming back out to, um, you know, we talked about the stock to flow earlier and I noticed, uh, Torb, your, your, your thumb went down, uh, yeah. which we're very pleased about at Bike Tree, certainly. <laughs> um, so, you know, what, what is it about the stock to flow model that is, um, well, maybe you can give a sort of a brief intro or overview of, of what it is and, and why you think it doesn't really sort of play out. So it is a regression uh, trying to predict the future value of Bitcoin. And as it's regressor or explanatory variable, it's trying to take scarcity. So there's no doubt that uh, Bitcoin derives its value from being scarce and then uh, the value has to appreciate when more people demand it. Uh, but the problem I have, uh, there I have several issues with this model. Um, one, I don't believe in any models uh, that are kind of that publicly available uh, can predict a future price of a um, highly liquid and traded asset. Uh, because if it were right, the mere fact that the model got uh, known uh, or discovered would change the kind of dynamics in the market, so it wouldn't be true anymore. So it's, I find it very strange how a lot of libertarians. Uh, with a kind of uh, favoring the Austrian school of economics uh, and Austrians tend to not be a very fa uh, fan of uh, uh, accumulations and then suddenly with the stock to flow model uh, they try to do all of the a lot of different econometric tests to prove its validity and although a lot of those tests have turned out to not be valid after all uh, that's not really where the discussion is the discussion is uh, kind of one step before that, uh, which is the model doesn't account for demand in any way. Uh, and it's very clear to me that uh, Bitcoin's price is primarily demand driven. <laughs> so I think that uh, scarcity is really important. Uh, the model gets that right. Uh, and then people uh, maybe rightfully think that Bitcoin will appreciate in the future. And then you have this model that mm, kind of give you an excuse for having that belief and then you build up a cult around it so it can actually end up being performative or kind of through a reflexivity type of dynamic where people uh, kind of putting a lot of value on the prediction from the stock to flow model behave as if it's true and then for a period it can uh, turn out to be true uh, we've seen this in the market before especially when black skulls was released the pricing of options uh, was not following the black skulls model Prior to its existence, after its existence, it had perfect fit for several years. But uh, it's just a mere premise that you can do a regression and predict the future value of an asset uh, with certainty. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, yes. Torb, Torb, this is music. This is yeah. music for my ears. Would you like my job? Would you like to be an advisory? I mean, I can't make you the founder because we can't change history. But, you know, you just put it so well. And I thank you for that. Oh, thank you. It's, it's a big relief, for Charlie. Uh, it's something we've talked hours and hours about. And uh, so, okay. Um, while we have you, I think another interesting dynamic that we we spoke about in the run up to this is that you know how does the uh, network continue to sustain itself 
um, when the block reward, so we've just had the halving, when the block reward uh, cuts in half. So, you know, minor revenues go from 18 million a day uh, to about 9 million a day uh, at mm -hmm. the same price level. So, you know, ha is this going to work? Will, there, will the network remain secure? Um, you know, what's next? What do we think will happen? I think for the indefinite future, it's impossible to say how this will play out. But in the near future, it's not an issue at all. And we have to remember that uh, the cur current uh, subsidy is still a subsidy. So it might actually be the case that we spend uh, too much resources on mining, that the network is too secure. Also, uh, as Paul pointed out in the previous section, uh, prior to the halving, we had an uh, exchange rate halving uh, with the uh, same effect on miners. So uh, the exchange rate uh, is much more important for you know, the changes uh, in the mining reward in form of the Coinbase uh, than the halvings happening every fourth year. Uh, another th in uh, interesting observation is that uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, or at least somewhere back in time, uh, miners actually sometimes produced empty blocks. Uh, they didn't take the hassle of including transactions for the fear of being orphaned, for the block for being a little bit larger, taking a little bit more time. Uh, and it made sense not to include the transactions if the transaction fees is too, too small a percentage of the total reward. Uh, but right now, I think we've seen uh, fees spiking up to close to 20% of total reward, uh, which means that it is economically nonsensical not to include those transactions. So miners will be more incentivized to include the transactions. And lastly, I think one thing that's really important to understand is that as long as Bitcoin remains the biggest SHA-256 mining blockchain, uh, and we have specialized hardware mining uh, this, uh, so that you cannot use for anything else, a lot of the security is derived from that because you don't have a lot of computing capacity you can suddenly hire and, so, uh, and attack the bit Bitcoin uh, blockchain with. Also, for a lot of transactions, waiting a little bit longer for a little bit more confirmation is not a problem. So if you cut the uh, reward in half, say that kind of naively that would translate into a halving of hash rate, well, wait twice the length. Uh, and you'll have the same level of security. So, uh, and especially with more uh, off-chain uh, type of transactions, be it Lightning or Liquid, uh, having a longer waiting period uh, for the closing transaction should not be a big deal. So I, it, I'm not too worried about the question of uh, kind of the viability uh, of the rewards going to miners, uh, at least over the next five years and uh, we have enough if issues to solve uh, in the meantime yeah it's an interesting distinction isn't it that um you know fees need to increase in order to can like can continue to to keep the incentive um I, I think it's really interesting point that you make about whether the network is is too secure um but you know, as we add more layers on top of it, sort of layer twos, if we have, um, you know, smart contracts on Bitcoin or, or digital gold, as, as we're going to talk about uh, later in the, in the show, you know, then, then we, you know, we need all the security that we can get. And um, I think there needs to be this shift t towards a more of an understanding of a fee market that you're paying for something that is really incredibly secure and decentralized and, and trustless. Um, and that's a, and that's a real privilege to have space on on the blockchain. Absolutely, agree? absolutely. Yeah. And but I think it's also really important because people think that if you have an evil major, major, majority, like a fifty one percent attack, they can do anything to the blockchain. They can steal every coin. They can rewrite all history. But that's very far from the truth. So uh, if they try to rewrite history far back in time, that will be extremely expensive. Which means that you'll always, and they cannot steal coins they haven't owned previously. Uh, so, in worst case, it just means that you'll have to wait a little bit longer for that super confirmation you want from the on chain transaction. Okay, that's a really interesting, really interesting perspective, actually. Have you, have, have you written anything um, at, in the research division of Arcane that, that you could send our viewers to to sort of look into that? Not on fees yet. It's on my to-do list, but <laughs> there's a lot on the to-do list. But uh, 
uh, I think especially around security and mining, uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings and there's also a lot of good blog posts by prominent Bitcoin developers that are not well known, kind of known well enough. It feels like something we uh, we just don't want to take for granted um, because... Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and it's also very likely that on-chain fees will increase. Uh, we see more and more batching, which means that the cost per single transaction can be low uh, at the same time as you pay a higher total uh, fee, uh, stuff like that. In, yeah, very true. Very true. So Max... Um, what what things does uh, as we sort of wrap up this this session um what what needs to happen for bitcoin in order to sort of fulfill its potential um or or just to to continue to grow and 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 be recognized and and, and useful uh well a lot really it's still an adolescent not even you know it's 11 years old um it's got a long way to go uh, what it has done is never been compromised um, it's it's slowly but surely on the on the tongues of you know traditional asset managers, uh, CNBC love a good Bitcoin banter. Um, but the way I see it, actually going you know the full distance, you know being around when we're still in our latter days, is for it to um, really peg against what I believe one day will be digital monies so digital pound digital dollar uh, and maybe one day the treasuries will have to hold x amount of bitcoin to hedge um or to back these digital monies so much like how uh fiat money used to be backed by gold anyway that's looking far into the future but in the in the short term let's say six to to, to ten years i think we need to um find regulated products that people trust and increase and uh, improve UI, um, and as was discussed earlier on, is for the next generation of people that use digital money is to really uh, value privacy and value owning your own wealth. And I think if if this doesn't shift, this financial crisis doesn't shift a lot of people's opinions, there will be another one in 10 years' time, um, and then Bitcoin will really have its heyday. Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, adoption and, and uh, widespread belief, I think we're still two or three years away from that. Brilliant. Thanks, Max. Uh, and so last question uh, over to Torb. So uh, one from the audience from Toby, who says, uh, I'm a fan of Bitcoin, but like to consider the opposite or contrarian view. What do you think would make Bitcoin collapse or become irrelevant for any reason? And how likely do you think that is? Oh, that's a very difficult question. Um... I think uh, lack of adoption uh, is a big uh, challenge because uh, if enough people own it, uh, it'll be protected from uh, harsh regulation. And I think that harsh regulation can really stop most of its use. Not 100%, you can push it down to the black market, but it'll make it, I mean, governments can make it very difficult for people to use Bitcoin. Uh, so I think that we, I think we have passed that level, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, for instance, in Norway, around 5% of the adult population owns Bitcoin. Uh, we should push that. You see the same numbers in Canada and Sweden. You see some higher numbers in some developing countries, but that's amongst those with internet connection. But the more ownership, uh, the less likely it is to be crushed by regulation. And I think that crushing by regulation is a real threat. Uh, of course, there are the potential of technical uh, challenges uh, it could be anything from a, an inflation bug to 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 something quantum computing. I'm, I don't have the technical expertise to really evaluate that, but there I think that although it'll be challenging, uh, social coordination, a hard fork will kind of save uh, the project. And to me, it's very important to realize that uh, while most so, so uh, if you look at complex systems, uh, you have this kind of uh, saying that any complex system that works uh, evolved, started simple and grew big. And then any attempt to design a complex system will fail. Uh, and I think the reason why I find it so hard to find out exactly why Bitcoin will fail is because it will meet every challenge and every hurdle by evolu kind of evolution and kind of work its way around it. So uh, it'll be more of a roadblock rather than a full stop, I think.
That is a that is a, a fantastic place to end um, Bitcoin from a Darwinian view. Uh, Bitcoin is a I, one tiny little point at the end. Yeah, uh, try to be really quick. So That's you right. had a question before this that was for me to prepare was uh, kind of the evolution of Bitcoin and how it went from kind of being uh, magic internet money uh, to kind of freedom money, both for criminals and those who believed in privacy, to be a speculative asset. And I see a lot of people now cheering when Wall Street is coming in, which is a bit puzzling to me uh, as a cypherpunk uh, kind of movement. Uh, but what I think, truly think is the next step is as a universal payment instrument. And there's been two hurdles for Bitcoin to be used as a payment rail. The cost of going fiat Bitcoin and Bitcoin fiat has been too high. That's been pushed down. You can do that for a uh, sub basis point cost now. You can do it through your bank. The other has been uh, technical scaling to send a lot of transactions with liquid and the lightning. Uh, we now solve that simultaneously. And with the apps like uh, Strike in the US, where you can have money in your bank account, at the same time pay a lightning invoice uh, with Tesla Coil Hour Solution, where companies can receive a Bitcoin uh, payment either on chain or off chain, but get it automatically into their fiat of choice. I think we'll see over the next five years an explosion in Bitcoin as a payment instrument in the back end hidden from the end users together with uh, the other use case as an investment asset but yeah Tom, thank you so much it's uh, it's been a really really fascinating conversation and, and i'd love to continue this um with you uh, in the future hopefully we'll be doing more of these and we can we can dive into it i think it's it's the really interesting um points of bitcoin so Tor, uh of of arcane and, and max of, of crypto compare thank you gentlemen um, I'll now hand back to Charlie to introduce our, our final uh, guest and panelist, uh, the one and only Mr. Daniel Masters. Good evening, Daniel. Or should I call you Danny? Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's a little dark here, so I'm just adjusting my lighting. I thought that was a sun in Cyprus, but I thought it was a bit later. Uh, it's it's that sort of thing. nighttime, yeah. Yeah, quite. Quite well. Thank you for coming. And and and, and it, you know, it, disclosure. Um, Danny's on our board, so I think I should probably tell everyone that that he's a he's a friend of ours. He's he's, he's one of us. So um, so thank you very much for spending your you know for taking the time to live your evening um, to spend here. Now um, I was talking the other day about DGLD with one of your colleagues. Now DGLD is gold on the yeah. blockchain. And um, with, this conversation has gone in many ways. We've looked at the history, um, the Bitcoin Foundation with John Matonius. We've looked at privacy with Paul Gordon and Dominic Frisby. Uh, we've had some fascinating research with uh, Max and Torb and so on. So, you know, it, it, it's let's talk about application. So, so why do you think gold needs to go onto the blockchain, and 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 what's you know where are you going with this project? All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I have to, for the sake of uh, housekeeping here, Charlie, uh, unfortunately, I have a hard stop in half an hour because I do have to jump onto another similar Don't event. Um, but we've got plenty of uh, time to talk about these things. So gold on blockchain. Um, I think that should best be broken down into a few discrete use cases. Um, and, you know, we can put those in, in sort of, framework of, of current circumstances as well, which I think speaks even louder to to every one of those use cases in actual fact. Um, so let's let's talk firstly about um, well, let's just lay out all three of them up front. So number one is a stable coin and a, a shelter from uh, Bitcoin volatility. For which there are, you know, a lot of uh, alternatives, but we'll highlight uh, where I think DGLD and gold tokens in general uh, score in that regard. Uh, there's a use case uh, in terms of a currency. So, uh, as as we've seen in the recent turbulence, some of the emerging market currencies, Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, South Africa, just absolutely destroyed, and and probably going to get worse. So. Uh, one and and in fact, actually, I believe in Lebanon. I think the currency has actually totally collapsed, and this is all a function of the the turbulence in global macro markets. And thirdly, is the use case for the traditional ETF buyer, and uh, there are hundreds of billions, I think, uh, of of dollars uh, in value tied up in gold ETFs. So let's let's just take those uh, three one at a time. Um, now, I think um, you know. The use of gold 
as a token, um, you know, I think can best be sort of summarized in the epithet uh, gold standard 2.0. And I think it's very important that, um, you know, we view this like, you know, in the context of, of these distressed currencies that you currently have. Uh, you might remember, you know, back, I think it was in 2015, in the early, early days of Bitcoin, uh, when Bitcoin was really struggling to sort of get above $200 or something. Um, one of its big rallies, which I think was from sort of 200 to 300 at that time, was indeed around uh, the issues that Greece had. And at the time, uh, there wasn't any gold tokens around, but Bitcoin was around. And um, the Greek finance minister, uh, you know, actually, as it turned out, and you know, in later disclosure, had talks with, some of the Bitcoin community uh, about whether Bitcoin could be, you know, a viable currency for Greece would have been a wonderful thing for them, actually. So, so you know, this is this is a real deal, and um, and I think that um, you know, we, we, as we enter this period of un, unqualified and unrestrained quantitative easing, uh, you know, we're looking at a regime where money supply is absolutely exploding. I mean, relative to global GDP, you're talking about doubling. By the time we're done with this virus um and, and levels which you know levels absolute levels and acceleration which was, uh, dwarfs 2008 and the other you know thing yeah on the flip side of that you know you also got to be conscious that uh, the backdrop is of a declining inventory of goods and services so you know rapidly inflating money supply rapidly depleting or depleted goods and services and, and it begins to sort of look a little and i'm not trying to be alarmist when i say this but i mean and i don't think we're going to go quite this far but you know the hyperinflation that was that was subject uh, to the, the German citizens were subject to in the Weimar Republic happened because uh, you know after an argument about whether they should pay reparations, the German population went on strike. Uh, the goods and services collapsed uh, in, in production, and and the government decided to pay everybody anyway, and and that led to the collapse of that currency. So I think governments are really playing with fire at the moment. Uh, um, there is the, you know, still a concept of full faith and credit in the U.S. government, but you know we're going to see a inventory of bonds sold in the public domain in the second quarter, uh, likes of which the markets never experienced. And again, you know, as though things aren't bad enough, while doing that, the president of the United States is trying to finger China with uh, the coronavirus uh, outbreak. And uh, as I was waiting for this call, there's something came across the Bloomberg that indeed the, the House has now put forward a sanctions bill on China for that reason. So if you think the Chinese are going to show up in big numbers to buy the largest bond auctions in the history of mankind, I'm not so sure. And I think the sniff, uh, it doesn't necessarily, you know, we, don't, we don't need to go from here to hyperinflation, but the sniff of, of panic or the sniff of lack of control in the uh, as the as the market tries to fund these uh, these massive uh, expansions in credit, um, I think could really uh, put a lot of currencies into a very volatile, if not terminal state. So you know, you have uh, in, in gold token in DGLD in particular, and I, I highlight our relationship with Blockchain.com. You know, a partner very carefully selected because they have the world's largest wallet infrastructure. You know, there are forty eight million wallets. And there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of wallets in the type of countries that could well end up looking for an alternative currency. So that's one use case. The second use case uh, is in the you know a shelter a shield from crypto volatility, and and that's kind of related. And I think it's become more related uh, as a use case because of the circumstances we face. So when you're long your bitcoin i mean you know there'll be the hodlers that will be long no matter what but i think the vast majority of people actually trim their bitcoin positions from time to time so what are your alternatives you can sell your bitcoin and you can leave a credit balance on an exchange probably not a great idea for security reasons you can sell your bitcoin and you can take that money out of an exchange and put it through bank and, you know, we all know the issues that happens when you try and move large volumes of crypto through your bank. Chances are you won't have a bank. So that's not a great option either. That leaves you sort of, then you sort of move on to US dollar tether and USDC um, and the dollar backed stable coins. And, and my description of these dollar backed stable coins is lipstick on a bank. Because ultimately, uh, in as much as there are any dollars, and in the case of tether, you know, there clearly aren't enough, but 
we don't exactly know how many and we don't exactly know where doesn't stop it from being an eight billion dollar asset in some miraculous suspension of disbelief um but nonetheless um if you're using one of the more legitimate coins then your money's in a bank and 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 again you know let's not forget uh, i'm here in greece and let's not forget that when greece had its major financial crisis the government simply stripped your money out of your bank account and if your stable coin is backed by a bank account and the money is stripped out of that your stable coin is screwed so that is not a great option either in my view um now what's great about dgld and actually i'll now split that and sort of separate ourselves from the other two main coins which is tether and pax is our coin exists entirely outside of the banking system because what we're trading with mainnet dgld is essentially a depository receipt for allocated swiss gold uh, and it's designed in a very robust way from a regulatory perspective so that gold remains your personal property through all stages of the token life cycle uh, and that has some profound implications in terms of how much purchase a, a regulator or an agency or government can get on that so you know it's not subject to any mifid rules it's not subject to any collective investment fund aifmd type legislation uh, it's not subject to commodities legislation because there's no hypothecation or leverage and uh, it's your property so it has very resilient qualities in that regard and so for me as a crypto investor uh, you know if i'm coming out of bitcoin temporarily then you know if i'm facing all of those options take my cash out leave my cash in take a stable coin in at the back by a us bank i kind of want gold and i'll live with the extra you know 3 4 5% volatility when i'm coming out of the 120% volatility regime i'll live with that extra volatility um for the sake of not having my uh funds essentially uh, interdictable uh in a many many ways by by banks and their and their, and their proxies so that's that that third use case um and again <laughs> these things the, the crisis is actually served to merge these together and you know, you'll see the color around this would 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 support that theory so um you know gold etfs you know huge marketplace and a lot of people buy gold etfs for you know two main reasons really one um is it going to be a store of real value well we've seen fed fund rates go negative this week uh, for the first time in history and before long at this rate and in the muscle market's predicting in 2020 all of 2020 uh, the prediction is negative interest rates in the US now so immediately you're getting a haircut um which is not great and um and not only that you know you're also trying to think about um whether you're uh you actually you know if you you're going to get your gold so never mind if you go into a bank account and you, you know when you're way out and you get a haircut are you going to get your gold at all? Because when you buy a gold ETF, you've got, uh, or an option, a call option on the gold ETF, even better example, you've got a call option market maker, a call option exchange, a call option clearer, um, probably um, some sort of uh, uh, a transfer agent. And that will sit on top of an ETF, which has got an SPV and another transfer agent and a pricing agent. And, and it, the list goes on and on. And and really, you know, if you're if you're really trying to hedge against systemic risk, i.e., you know, I mean, we we thought not not two weeks ago that it was possible the banks would close and the exchanges would close. Guess what? You have no you have no access to your gold at that point. Well, with DGLD, you can rock up in Castel San Pietro in Switzerland with your iPhone with your DGLD keys, and you can load the back of your pickup truck with gold. So it really is very resilient to both resist to 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 legislation. Uh, to interdiction um, and to systemic risk, and um, and look, a lot of those properties are are what everybody loves gold for. Um, uh, but indeed, you know, in buying a gold token, you're getting a security around your gold in a top quality vault. You're getting fr you know frictionless pricing. Uh, you're getting um, the ability to you know not have to pay a big markup for small format gold because you're buying wholesale gold. And yet you can do it in very, very small quantities. So, you know, long story, but that's that's the three use cases for DGLD. No, fabulous. And I think, you know, getting back to the to the to the the basic premise, I think the the point you, you, you made I think is 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 a good one. That it's kind of odd that there are some people out there who think that, you know, gold is the enemy of Bitcoin and Bitcoin's job is to overtake gold. Mm. 
actually they're natural best friends. One's just the old school version and one's the new school version of kind of thing. And, and, and if you're coming out of the racy new one, which, which has the ability to go down a lot when things go wrong, as we've seen a few times in the past, where a you know, bad bear market for gold is a third, um, you know, it is a good stable coin, isn't it? And, and, and you're still maintaining that spirit of the space and you know, arm's length from the system um, and, and so on. I would say on the ETFs that you know, most people buy them because it, it, it works from a regulatory perspective and you're trying to invest in gold and, you know, you're not betting on the end of the world necessarily, you're betting on falling real rates and that sort of thing. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, end, the end of the world um, investor has a very different hat to a, you know, to a diversified investor, a diversified yeah. investor assuming the world's, world's uh, continues as a going concern, notwithstanding, you know, big economic shocks and problems and, uh, uh, that sort of thing, and um, you know. So, but I, but I do, I, I do take that point. And it's what it's worth, Danny. I mean, you know, my, I'm writing an article for the Alchemist magazine tomorrow morning, mm. and um, you, you know the answer because I've already put it on the Denver Gold Conference two months ago, and that's gold seven thousand by twenty thirty, and um, you know that that's that's well, not bad. Me. But but Bitcoin outperforms gold, of course, doesn't it? Yeah, but you know, like you say, Charlie. I I mean, I'm I'm, I'm jumping onto a call later where I'm fully expecting a sort of pitch pitch battle with some. One of these uh, Bitcoin max or maximalists, um, which is ironic, really, because I spent the last ten years fighting, you know, the traditional legacy system, and I am a Bitcoin maximalist. But, um, but, but I think you need to look at the intersection of, you know, traditional finance and digital finance, um, and you know, we're trying desperately to squeeze Bitcoin into that intersection. You know, we do it all the time, trying to put MIFID transferable securities on exchanges all over the world, and it's a thankless task. Um, we get it done, but it's very, very difficult. So, you know, to me, you know, the the benefits of, uh, you know, where, where Bitcoin and gold coins or gold intersect is if you are, are comfortable with a gold coin, which is a much easier sell to a traditional investor um, because you're not just got digital and crazy asset, you've got digital and traditional asset. It's an easier sell. And that universe is enormous compared to the true crypto universe. And so rather than trying to push Bitcoin into that intersection space, which is very hard to do, why not seed that intersection space with you know, sort of a gateway crypto, you know, crypto on your friendly asset, you know, uh, whether it be a dollar or whether it be gold. And I think actually, you know, I can't think of anything better for Bitcoin than for the you know to the the, the, the the proliferation of stable coins, whether they be Chinese yuan stable coins or US dollar coins or gold coins. I can't think of anything better to actually get investors more comfortable with hardcore, you know, distributed trustless crypto. Um because because going cold turkey from the old world to the new world is very difficult for a lot of people. A final yeah, point just on the ETFs yeah. is you know if you look at things like you know uh, ETFs securities and and, and uh, PHAU and, and instruments like that GLD, the issuers go to great lengths, great lengths, to essentially you know pull this gold in an SPV, write debt securities, link the gold to the debt securities, use a security trustee to make that link, such that the securities holders on the stock exchange in which it trades can look through the issuer via the security trustee to the gold that's in the depository, that's in the vault, right? So, uh, you know, prospect the, the, the PHAU prospectus is probably 160 pages long. And all it's trying to do is link that gold to the buyer of the security, right? But at the end of the day, you've still got the risk right at the bottom of that stack that that gold's in someone's vault. And you've written an ETF on it, that gold's in someone's vault. Now, with DGLD, you cut all of that rest of that stack out and what you're trading is the same digital depository receipt that would be fed into the SPV at the bottom of the ETF stack. So it's actually a lot simpler as well. And it doesn't materially, well, I think it materially improves your, your performance risk, regardless of the motivation for actually buying the asset. So on the one hand, if, if I can, there's a question from the audience I think is, is pretty interesting. You know, we have the... The, the store of value of gold that's been tested over many more years than Bitcoin and, and the sort of store of value, but also big upside that, that Bitcoin yeah. can give us. I mean, how do the two mix together? What would a portfolio look like? <laughs> any sort of it would look like my portfolio. <laughs> 
Um, you can have both of the best of both worlds. Look, I've I've only had uh, I, I, I you know for, for my my personal investing portfolio, um, I would tell you this five seconds it's about ninety five percent Bitcoin and five percent gold, and that's pretty much all I own. You know, in the, in the liquid in liquid you know. Space. But Danny, why so conservative? You know, what's your fear of one hundred percent Bitcoin? <laughs> um. Um. Maybe I should tidy that up a little bit. You're right. I'm not sure. But, but you know, um, and I'm, look, I'm very bullish for Bitcoin right now for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but nonetheless, um, there have been periods of time when I, I haven't been. And um, or when indeed, you know, I mean, strange as it may sound, Bitcoin can actually be very non-volatile for a, a period of time. And then you may actually want to cycle out into, into something else. And, and let's not forget, you can't really use Bitcoin very effectively as collateral you can use dglv as collateral so you can park that hypothecate it go borrow the dollars you want buy the stock you want and you'll be fine so so yeah i mean look i i just see i don't see dollars gold bitcoin as sort of red amber green i see gold as risk off and bitcoin as risk on essentially and uh, and i'm pretty risk on at the moment i, I want to put two quick questions here from the audience sure. One, um, what about altcoins? Quickly, please. Altcoins. Yeah. Altcoins. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're going to define by altcoins. I would say that a large number of coins, um, uh, certainly emanating from the ICO space, have been massive disappointments. Really, I mean, we've had a bunch of write-offs. I've had a bunch of write-offs. Hundred percent write-offs. Um, uh, and I, I'm not sure why, because I think that in some cases the companies that raise that money uh, had enough to do to do enough to make their companies viable, and yet many of them didn't. And even the ones that are, you know, we're heavily involved in uh, you know, Aventus, for example, uh, which we, you know, did their ICO with them, and, and we're big holders in that company. It's a great technology company. Um, you know, they did raise a lot of money. They have they have spent it the correct way. Um, but their token, um, you know, still hasn't performed at all. It's been it's been very, very, very weak. So uh, there's something wrong in the economic economic econometric model uh, of altcoins. If you're talking about ICO type coins, and, and and it needs to be explicitly fixed, and that's not helped by the intervention of the SEC. Okay, and find the last one. This is a bad, well. Well, it's the penultimate question because there's a bit of there's a there's another sure. question. Um, sure. What might make Bitcoin collapse? This is a question that we've had earlier. And that's what I'd yeah, ask. I was listening. I was I was listening to that. Um, well, it's listen. It's something that I I worry about and I and I fight against all the time. And I think in actual fact, um, we've probably come closer to that than people care to think. I mean, let's look back to the summer of last year and the FCA's consultation paper, CP1922. Um, that paper essentially was a beachhead uh, that sought to essentially destroy Bitcoin. And the FCA made a, a statement in writing that they thought Bitcoin was a worthless asset and, and, and broke their tech neutrality rules in doing so. But their game plan at the time was to prevent the sale of, of, of crypto linked to uh, securities to retail and effectively to wholesale as well because they're going to look through the wholesale owners and they even at one point tried to start regulating open source code that was writing software applications for the bitcoin network and we fought tooth and nail against the fca and we blew up our relationship with them because we brought in a lot of heavy hitting politicians into that debate and i don't think they appreciated it um but it was a, you know it was the right decision and that ban did not happen in the end but had they had a victory there, um, their their full and stated intention was to extend it across multiple, you know, not just the perimeter of regulation which they already had, but to extend it to wallets, custodial wallets, non-custodial wallets through the software link, um, and into exchanges, and to apply AML D5 in a really hostile way. I mean, th I think these guys came just back from the edge, and, and you can't underestimate how influential the FCA are in terms of all of the European regulators. Because the battle we have with them there reverberated in every regulator we deal with in Europe, which is which are many. So, so it, that is an existential fight. Now, I, that's why I cannot tell you how delighted I am. Paul Jones has stepped up. You know, one of the biggest macro fund managers in the world. Now, does the FCA really want to turn around to come with someone like Paul Jones 
and Julian Robertson and Lewis Bacon and Mike Platt and say, you know what, uh, we're not really prepared to uh, to to play in the products that you twenty eight billion dollars worth of capital wants to invest in. That would be suicide. So so I'm hoping we've sort of crossed a Rubicon there. And I think this JP Morgan news about servicing Je- Coinbase and Gemini back to back with the Paul Jones news. I actually tweeted this evening at the FCA saying, you know, wake up, guys, you know, look what's going on here. Is Britain going to get left behind because clearly uh, the, the barriers are coming down. So do we think this uh, market shock from COVID-19 that was a, a black swan or a white swan, however you want to look at it, do, you, do we think it was one of the best things that could have happened to Bitcoin at this time? Um, well, I, look, I wouldn't want to wish COVID-19 on anyone for any reason. Um, I, you know, I, I, and, I, and I, I say this in an ironic way, uh, that I, I can't think of a better event for our business. In, in every way, shape and form, it supports gold coin, it supports um, Bitcoin prices, it supports Bitcoin client flow. Uh, it's brought other people into the business now, which are supporting the regulatory perspective of it. Our gold coin and Bitcoin are both COVID friendly instruments you know they don't require banks to work in close proximity they don't require atm machines they don't require credit cards um i mean there's lots and lots of positives have come from that and and obviously the economic carnage um although i learned this lesson in 2008 you know our, our commodities fund was one of the best performing funds in the world in 2008 when we were up 28 percent, i think on about five vol when the rest of the market halved um but and while we were busy high-fiving each other we failed to notice that half of our clients have gone bust, and um, and our assets, you know, having gone up thirty percent um, in performance, went down fifty percent in redemption. So you know, you have to be careful what you wish for, uh, and I'm hoping this isn't that bad. But it, but I have to be honest and say that it's actually probably Bitcoin and crypto and digital gold are probably one of the few beneficiaries. Right. Well, Danny, thank you very much. I think that um, you know our viewers have had enough. We've we've been on air for what's well, coming up to two hours now. And, God, uh, Charlie, you're really pushing the envelope there, aren't you? I know, I know. <laughs> you, had to, you know, had to, had to pay by the minute or something for telephone lines or what have you, which we used to do in the past. You don't these days. It's all everything seems to be free. So, um, look, Danny, thank you very much. And um, uh, and James, do you have any final comments you'd like to to, to say to our viewers um, who are very kindly I would, with us? I would, I would just like to say, uh, come visit us at coinshares.com and dgld.ch. Thank you, Danny. Now, James, do you have any? Right, guys, have a good comments? evening. Yeah, have thank you very day. much. Uh, thank you, Danny. So, um, yeah, signing off words. It's been a great event. We've heard uh, from a lot of speakers from across the industry. Um, and, and of course, uh, this won't be the last time you'll hear from us. We are planning to, to do more regular uh, webinars during this new environment we're in, uh, looking a little bit more into the on-chain data uh, that we specialize in at ByteTree, uh, as well as bringing in other research analysts uh, to discuss. So. Hold tight, keep an eye on us. Uh, let us know uh, your your thoughts and feedback. We're always welcome. Um, Charlie, Mark in the control room uh, and the whole team at Bytree for putting it on. Thank you. We're signing off. Do a wave. Should do a wave. Bye.